Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Since first appearing on Rich Planet TV over five years ago, today's guest has established himself as an authority on a subject you will struggle to find covered comprehensively in university courses. Do you ever stop to think about your thoughts? Have you ever considered that your thoughts are being steered without your knowledge? Are you really in control of your thoughts? I'd like to welcome back onto the show mind control researcher and the author of Your Thoughts Are Not Your Own, Neil Saunders. Welcome, Neil. Welcome, Neil. On the phone, Richard. All right. We start, sorry, hang on. Just there. Sorry, I've just got to go on Facebook and check what we're all offended about, otherwise I won't have anything to talk about, I'm afraid. Okay. So, and I'd best just tweet a lie as well, uh, because otherwise people won't be impressed with my life. So. Um, hang on, just water skiing with Colin Farrell. Marvellous. There you go. Right. Um, yeah, crack on. You sure you don't want to do this via text? Um, well, my phone switched off, Neil. I switched it off because we're doing an interview. Well, then how do you know what's going on in the world? Like, honestly. I mean, first off, let me just say, okay, what is wrong with people taking loads and loads and loads of photos of themselves, right? There's something distinctly psychologically insecure about taking loads and loads of photos of yourself, particularly if you're doing the, 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 the duck face selfie, which is this sort of joker face, like, mm. A, you're taking photos of yourself a lot, which is, it shows uh, a distinct narcissism, and then you alter your face so that you look like a sort of cheap Chinese sex doll. <laughs> so, why? Right. Well, Neil, uh, set the context for what we're going to talk about today there. Uh, we're going to talk about social media. Um, but I mentioned in the intro there, Neil, that, that you were first on five years ago, and I think quite a lot has changed with respect to the internet yeah, over yeah. five years. Absolutely. Because social media was certainly less well used five years ago when yeah. it was probably just just getting going, I would, I, I would have thought. And there, were more than one, there was more than one social media site. Now we just seem to have this one Facebook, which uh, well, seems to have overtaken them all. I mean, you, you asked me, like, uh, I think it was like the second show or something like that, it's like, how do you feel that the internet has helped you with, with research like this? And I think I said at the time, so the, the internet's fine. It's like a library. Okay, there's good information on there and there's bad information on there. There's not an awful lot of information that's on the internet that you couldn't find in other places. It's just sort of the ease that, that people, for people can reach it. The problem is that basically if you use the analogy of a library, most people are just using the books to hammer nails in. They're not actually using them for their proper purpose. Right, right. The other thing is that they're I'm using them for specific sort of point proving, or um, they're, they're not using them as weapons. They're yes. using points as ammunition a lot of the time, rather than sort of a, a, as a discourse. Right. The the other thing is that I am actually genuinely concerned that if some people drown, the only thing that they're going to see flash before their eyes is a series of different mobile phone screens. This is when someone's life flashes before their eyes when uh, they die. Their life such as it is, yeah, absolutely. You could just play their Facebook page <sighs> or their timeline. Exactly. This, yeah. that, that, that's exactly what it is because people are so connected with this. It's like an umbilical cord, basically. Mm. Well, 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 we'll expand on that, Neil, mm. in, in, in this interview. Um, now, I, I gave a lecture a little while ago now um, talking about subversion and demoralization. Mm. And I went through well, non-internet techniques, um, you know, like ma mainstream media or things, uh, laws being passed, uh, all kinds of things that, that I think is going on in the UK that the, that the Soviets were running a subversion campaign. Okay, yeah. And what I said was, regarding the internet, I said you could do a whole new chart, like the one that I've just shown, uh, f just for Facebook, Yeah. i.e. how it is um, subversive or damaging or what have you. And, and that's really what we're going to try and expand on in today's talk, but just to say that we're at risk of being considered too um, bit, uh, yeah. mi middle, well, I'm middle-aged, <laughs> middle-aged, <I'm getting> <laughs> middle-aged <laughs> men. Uh, are, are, we, are we just cynical bit of middle-aged men well, complaining Facebook? Well, people don't appreciate, Facebook? you know, when I was young, all this internet was all fields, Richard, and it's just not anymore, is it? Don't mm. know, obviously, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there is an aspect of that. And just, just sort of reiterate, it, like anything, it's a medium. Social media is, is a medium. A library is a medium. A hammer is a medium. They can be used in positive ways, and they can use, be used in negative ways. What my concern is, that is that the setup of social media and the internet particularly in general, sort of encourages people to go to, uh, to fall into patterns of sort of 
uh, for want of a better expression, bad behaviour or sort of, you know, they, they put on, um, sort of put on, put on like an act or adopt roles or mm -hmm. something. And I think the, the, the actual sort of setup of the internet is, is sort of like, it, it leads into that. I mean, this is a quote here that I've got. He said, um, the main problem with the internet is that the wealth of available information batters and flatters people into a position of gullible acceptance. We tend to gravitate towards articles and quotes that support our suppositions with confirmation bias, ignoring evidence that disproves or questions our beliefs, and we rarely fact check. That quote's from Albert Einstein in a 1998 interview that he gave to Reader's Wives magazine. How do I know that's true? Well, I found it on the internet. Uh, just in case anybody, did, a magazine is like a 3D blog. It's like, it's like it's, you can hold it in your hands. It's, it's not like the internet, basically. So. Right. <laughs> so what's your point about the, the quotations? That, pe the, that people on Facebook are not checking the sources? Is yeah, that I mean, that, that's, I've just made that quote up, obviously. Mm. But it sounds like it has authority or it has gravitas. And so you get a lot of sort of things where people uh, either misquote or, or they assume that just because it's a meme, it's, it's true. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, the, the point stands that, that people don't tend to fact check. We were talking just before we came on is that the Freud quote uh, that is, is bandied around that he never, ever said. And uh, th there's numerous things. There was a cracked article recently. This is, um, you know, famous misquotes from people that, that, that people never said and such like that. The, the Freud one is, that is, is basically along the lines of if you're depressed, are you sure that you're not just surrounded by assholes? Um, and no, it's not Freud. That's never been attributed to Freud. But it's, it's somehow become sort of popular in the sort of internet lexicon, basically. All right, Neil. Well, t tell us what Zimbardo means. Well, I mean, f r the point about the internet is that it doesn't require facts. Because again, because of the nature of it, it's sort of a very quick medium and stuff like that. So it requires variety and immediacy just to keep people interested for a time. It doesn't really require accuracy or longevity. Philip Zimbardo was a social sci scientist or social psychologist, and he did a, a series of investigations that some people will have heard of. The two famous ones were the Stanford Prison Experiment and um, a car experiment. The car experiment, just to sort of briefly explain, uh, the, the, and this might be a, a sort of analogous, but basically the point is that he, he left two cars, one in a, a, a very built-up area, like a city, like a major city, with the, the bonnet up and the door open. And he did, left a similar car in a rural community. And according to Zimbardo's um, experiment, With the bonnet open and yeah, the door? Yeah, yeah, they're both the same. Right. And basically what he discovered, or well, according to this, uh, the results of the proposed results of this uh, experiment, in the city, uh, within five minutes, they'd taken the battery, they'd stolen everything of any value, uh, and just you know, left it there. Whereas in the, uh, the rural community, somebody had shut the door, uh, closed the bonnet, I believe they'd even fixed a spark plug or something <laughs> like that. And it, to be quite honest, it sounds a bit folksy, but the point is that what Zimbardo um, uh, suggested was that, that the anonymity provided by a large city, because you've got so many people, because it's such a large area or something, like that, because you don't feel that you're sort of on show, that this allows you to sort of act in ways that you wouldn't normally, uh, you know, you would transgress your normal personality because you can get away with that. Right. I Similarly, see. with the Stanford Prison uh, experiment, which is, is more famous, essentially, it's what Big Brother was based on. It, uh, the people that probably know about this, they, they split people into adopted roles, prisoners or guards, and then they had to sort of act out these roles. Now, very soon, the people who were designated the, the prisoners got annoyed with the fact that they were being treated seemingly unfairly. And so they started to rebel against the people who had adopted the, the, ro the roles of guards. F actually, what actually the, the experiment was, was cancelled because the guards ended up taking the uh, prisoners into the basement and torturing them with a, uh, a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they had to do it because basically what happened is they'd, they'd taken on the role so seriously that they were actually just, you know, playing a part. Mm. One of the things that they found that was that was most sort of significant in that was the fact that all the guards had um, aviators, you know, mirrored glasses or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it found that basically just something as simple as a pair of dark glasses or, or something like that, it, it provides the separation that, that allows you to sort of mentally move away mm. from the subject. And, and another example of this is you would see ex, um, uh, interviews with uh, journalists and such. And they'll say that when they're in a war scenario or something, they'll, they'll find themselves very, very, like, um, um, really intently looking through the viewfinder. 
because basically it's not real then. There's that separation that, that sort of your brain sort of makes that separation. The problem is that when you do this on the internet, both of those circumstances seem to occur. You get the anonymity and you also get the de-individuation, which is the fact that you can blend into the crowd and nobody's going to catch you and stuff like, like that. Like the analogy of leaving the car in the city. Exactly, exactly. The problem with this is that basically, again, on the internet, this allows people to adopt roles. And all that this encourages is people to act like arseholes. Like, because they feel they can get away with it. The, the, the two points, the de-individuation and the separation, it encourages, basically, people to be horrible. And but you combine that with, say, yeah. a fragile ego or some sense of identity that is gained through, through that particular point that you're trying to make or whatever, and you're going to get all sorts of horrible vitriol flying around, basically. So, so just to turn that around, Neil, mm. so what you're saying is if you remove any moral scrutiny, mm. people will behave badly uh, or, or um, do can. think can behave yeah. badly. So is that not in indicating what the true, if you had no restraints or anything that was no laws, nothing keeping you in your moral box, if mm. you like. Not, w would everyone behave in this abhorrent way that some people do on Facebook? Or no, not necessarily, but it's basically people tend to go along with the crowd. This is, this is the exact same psychological um, reason that people get involved in um, riots, for example. Um, Gustave Le Bon talks about this sort of hi hypnotic effect that comes over people. This is why fish swim together in shoals, because you look like one big fish rather than a thing. So it's that strength in numbers. And hypnotically what happens is you tend to adopt the uh, ethos of the group. You, you sort of sacrifice your own um, psychological makeup and uh, your own ego, so to speak, in order to, to uh, become part of this group that is stronger. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly psychologically um, reassuring to be part of a group. Perhaps a lot of um, parents might be interested in this particular show, or, or anyone really who's, who knows people who are incessantly using social media, in particular Facebook, and we're, we're going to explore more of this in the rest of uh, today's interview. And in particular, we'll, next we're going to talk about social media dependency. <laughs>